It's really a pleasure to be here, and these are the disclosures that I have um, uh, just in uh, preparation for this talk. So I wanted to really cover six topics today. Um, the first is just to uh, give an introduction to immunodeficiencies in general. And this is sort of uh, a, just a very brief, uh, quick overview of the clinical presentation of immunodeficiencies in general uh, related to each of the different uh, compartments of, of the immune system. I want to talk about why this is important to you, why this topic actually uh, hopefully has some applicability to all of you here. Um, I'm going to talk about genetic testing uh, because this has become really a major part of what we do uh, in the immunodeficiency world. I'm going to talk about flow cytometry and its role in pairing with genetic testing. And uh, then I'm going to talk about some other functional testing that we do, just touch briefly on that. And lastly, talk about something that has really been, I think, a real success in the immunodeficiency world. It's been uh, certainly in the metabolic genetics world and others uh, screening for, for defects at birth, uh, but only recently have we been able to take advantage of this in the immunodeficiency world and talk a little bit about that. So that's what we'll do. I'm going to sort of include in this some uh, hopefully several uh, brief sort of clinical uh, cases that I'll give you examples of, of, of how this works. So First of all, just to give you an idea of an overview of the immune system. So when I think about the immune system, I sort of break it down into these four major compartments. And it's just easier for me to sort of get my head around. And, and uh, Amit last week talked a, a lot about patients who have uh, defects in the, in the B cell compartment. But I wanted to just talk briefly about, uh, again, what each of these compartments does and how patients with defects that are predominantly in one of these compartments present clinically. Because I think that um, as you think about one of the one of the problems that I mean, uh, uh, posed last week is that on the lab medicine side, the question becomes, you know, which tests are the appropriate tests to be doing? Should we should we stage testing in a way? And, and I think playing into that is, of course, the clinical presentation. And so it's, it's worthwhile to just, just as a reminder, to remember what each defects in each of these compartments present like. So let's, let's walk through this. So on the innate side of the immune system, there are two major compartments, the complement system and the phagocytes. And just remember that the, really the main role of the complement system is a role of opsonization. It basically puts handles on slippery, slimy bacteria so that uh, the immune system can get a hold of them. And it does a similar thing with cells from our own body that die. And uh, as they, they die, they need to be uh, taken up, degraded, gotten rid of. And, and so it plays its most important role is in opsonization. Now, as the complement proteins break down, uh, they also may act as chemoattractants and, and uh, uh, may attract immune cells to sites of inflammation. But if we look at what happens if the complement uh, system is, doesn't work, these patients, as you might predict, based on what we know the complement system does, they get invasive infections with encapsulated organisms. So strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitides, uh, these encapsulated organisms cause major problems in these patients, typically sepsis, uh, joint infections, other things can happen. In addition, because uh, opsonization of uh, our own cells and cell fragments as they're dying is important, uh, these patients get severe autoimmune disease. And typically, it's either lupus or a lupus-like glomerulonephritis. And so this is how, in general, how patients with complement deficiencies tend to present. Okay, Now, um, patients with phagocyte disorder, so remember that the phagocytes are often the first cells that are deployed to any site of inflammation. Uh, their job is to clean up the mess, to uh, take in and digest uh, organisms that they meet there, debris from dead and dying cells. And uh, I, I tell the medical students that, you know, you remember the phagocytes because these are the cells that go out and they eat and eat and eat and then they throw up on themselves. They, they digest what they have eaten and they put pieces of what they have eaten on their cell surface in MHC class 2 molecules so that they can show other parts of the immune system what they've just eaten, right? And so they, you can um, imagine then what might happen in patients who have phagocytic disorder. So, so these patients uh, get recurrent skin and soft tissue abscesses. They might get abscesses in the lymph nodes because the phagocytes go out into the tissues. If they can't degrade the organisms that they've ingested, they then migrate back to the local draining lymph node, taking those organisms with them, and the patients may then get lymphadenitis. 
Um, in addition, uh, these patients who have phagocytic defects often have poor wound healing because, again, you need phagocytes to get rid of the debris from wounds and help clean that up. And many of these patients have chronic gingivitis because this is a place where you've constantly got debris that's needing to be cleaned up, and, and it's one of the hallmarks of patients with phagocytic disorders. Now, moving over to the adaptive side of the immune system, uh, of course, the B cells are, play an important role in immunoglobulin production, and, and that's their main role, but remember that B cells can also act as antigen-presenting cells. They can take in antigen using their cell surface immunoglobulin. They break that down and digest it and present that in MHC class II molecules as well. So, so in patients who have B cell defects, they can't make good immunoglobulin responses, and as a result, these patients get recurrent bacterial sinopulmonary infections. That's the classic presentation of patients with immunoglobulin defects. And so, you know, most of the, as I'll show you in a moment, more than half of the immunodeficiencies that we see are B cell or antibody disorders, okay? So uh, then the last compartment uh, is the T cell compartment. And I sort of think about the T cells as really being the generals, the assassins, and the psychologists of the immune system. Okay, you've got, you've got the, the generals that are the helper T cells that play a role in helping B cells to class switch and directing the immune response. You've got the CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells that are really the assassins of the immune system. Their job is to go around and look for cells that are harboring terrorists, viruses, fungi, intracellular organisms that may be hanging out. And the, of course, the cytotoxic T cells, they, they recognize those viral or fun, fungal um, uh, peptides that have been broken down from inside the cell being presented in MHC class one. They see that and they tell the cell, you know, it would be better instead of com committing treason you know, by harboring a terrorist, it would be better that you just die. And so they, <laughs> they, they give then that, the, the handshake of death. Uh, they, they snuggle up to the cell, they deliver, they deliver cytotoxic granules that contain perforin and granzyme and, and kill that target cell or convince it to undergo programmed cell death. And then lastly in the T cell compartment, we've learned a lot in the last decade or so really about these regulatory T cells, cells that are really the psychologists of the immune system. Their job is to go around uh, to tell the, 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 the other immune cells, you know, that viral infection we had last week, it's gone now. You did a great job fighting it off though, and you just need to settle down, take it easy, don't get so riled up, okay? So that's, that's what these regulatory T cells do. And, and so um, they play a major role in preventing autoimmune disease, okay? Now, you can imagine, based on what we know then that T cells do, what are the symptoms of patients who have T cells def defects? Well, they, they of course get invasive fungal infections, things like uh, invasive uh, infections with pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, other invasive fungal infections. They get recurrent, uh, severe, or unusual viral infections, and they get autoimmunity because each of those three uh, functions of the T cells are absent, okay? Now, there are some disorders where only one of those may, may be absent, and as a result, <laughs> The patients may exhibit just those symptoms. But overall, these are sort of how we think about these defects in these different uh, compartments of the immune system and how we, how we sort of at least kind of quickly put patients based on what their infectious history is, whether they've got autoimmunity, how we kind of quickly slot them into one of these boxes to think about the workup that we then need to do in the lab to figure out what's going on. Now, there are patients who have these combined defects who have both problems with making antibodies and problems with their T cells. And uh, these are patients often uh, where the, they, they can't provide appropriate T cell help to the B cells, and so they have, they have both defects. All right, now, when you look at sort of the overall pie of immunodeficiencies, people say, how big is this pie? How many patients are we talking about? Well, in terms of the number of patients, th this pie is about the size of pediatric cancer, okay? or about the size of the number of patients with multiple sclerosis, okay, in terms of the number of patients. So it's not, these are individually rare diseases, but together not that rare really. And I, I'm hoping that I can convince you by the end of this talk that in fact they're less rare than we used to think they were. Uh, that in fact they're more common, there are more of these patients floating around there, out there, they're presenting in our clinics in ways that you might not think of as an immunodeficiency, uh, but they're there. And I think that we have now the tools to go after them. Now, so what is the current state of immunodeficiency? So, 
really the revolution that has taken place in the immunodeficiency world has been driven by understanding the molecular defects that drive these diseases. And the beautiful thing about this is that it really started here at the University of Washington. Elo Giblet, who is a hematologist here, she def was the first to define a molecular defect in immunodeficiency. She defined adenosine deaminase deficiency, published that in 1972, and subsequently identified uh, uh, PNP deficiency. These were metabolically defined, okay? They weren't defined by the genetics, but they were metabolically defined uh, and enzymatically defined uh, by her. And um, she, of course, uh, was a, w spent her career here at the University of Washington. Now, uh, this field has really exploded, and really beginning in 1994 was when the first genetic defects started to be published in the immunodeficiency world. And there has been an explosion uh, of really genetics in this field, and we now have about 270 single gene defects that can give uh, that can give a phenotype of an immune deficiency, okay? And as I'll show you in a couple of moments, the spectrum of the diseases that these cause has really broadened. And as we've begun to understand the genetics and identify patients, um, we've begun to understand how these patients masquerade in other clinics besides just the immunodeficiency clinic. So that gets, to, gets us to why is this important to you? And it really comes to this, that that immunodeficiencies are being identified in broader fields of medicine, and we've really now begun to talk about these as immune-mediated diseases as opposed to just immunodeficiencies. So, so diseases that I think of as immune deficiency disorders or immune-mediated diseases where there are known genetic defects, of course, we've got the recurrent infections, which is sort of when, when you talk to people about immunodeficiencies, this is what people think about. But, of course, bridging into that, we've now got a number of molecular defects that can cause, uh, dir directly cause autoimmunity as their primary presentation. Autoinflammatory disorders, the periodic fever syndromes, for instance. Uh, hemophagocytosis, the primary hemophagocytic disorders. Cancer, there are a number of genetic defects that have an immune uh, dysregulation component or an immune deficiency, GATA2 deficiency, for instance, that is a direct predisposition for development of cancer. And, uh, and so, we know that many of these uh, defects can, uh, can uh, roll over into, uh, into the cancer uh, arena. And, uh, and in fact, what's interesting is some of the defects that we're identifying that cause immune deficiency when they are germline actually have been found in tumors as somatic mutations. Very interesting, and that field is really just kind of blossoming. And then, of course, the bone marrow failure disorders. And so I think of all of these as immune-mediated diseases, and so I would Hopefully, I can convince you that um, it's worth thinking about these diseases more broadly, that these aren't just the patients who have recurrent infections. Second is that these aren't just for kids anymore. So uh, Amit talked last week about adult onset disease, and, and I agree with the things that he said. The, uh, what I would add to that is the, that as we have begun to do next generation sequencing, exome sequencing, et cetera, we are beginning to find patients with milder mutations in these classic immunodeficiency genes that can live into adulthood and, and for instance, present as lupus. I have a friend uh, who uh, she studies RAG1, RAG2 deficiency that's typically associated with severe combined immunodeficiency in kids. So she just found a patient with lupus, an adult patient in her 30s who has lupus and has a, has a hypomorphic sort of uh, milder mutation in RAG1, RAG2 and has lupus. And, and so we're finding more and more of these and we are going to find that these will be the cause of, of a larger number of diseases. And I've put here some of the diseases, some of the recently identified genes that we are now finding frequently in adults with certain of these disorders. The third reason why I think that this is important to know about is that adult PID patients, immunodeficiency patients, have traditionally been followed at Children's Hospital because that's where we had expertise. These were kid diseases, and a lot of times before antibiotics and other good therapeutic options, these patients sometimes often would die before they got into adulthood. They're not doing that anymore. They're surviving. And so there weren't adult docs to see these patients. So we've been fortunate to train these two uh, hotshot young immunology allergy guys, uh, Drew Ayers and uh, Matt Altman, who trained in our program. They're internists who then did AI fellowships and are now here 
on staff and have, be, uh, have opened an immunodeficiency clinic, an adult immunodeficiency clinic here. We are beginning to move now some of our patients here, more of our adult patients, and we're actually, you know, uh, children's has sort of been kind to let us see adults at children's, but they don't like it when we're doing an IVIG infusion on an 80-year-old woman who then has an anaphylactoid reaction in the infusion center. So uh, understandably, <laughs> um, so, so, uh, so they'd like to have them over here. And so there will be more, we'll be shifting more of our adult patients here to the UW. So you may see more of these tests coming through as a result. Um, and, and ultimately, I think the way that we see this is that we will have co-clinics and we will sort of, the, the immunologists will sort of move between, because we have privileges at both institutions, move between the clinics at both institutions. And so you're likely to see more of these patient samples coming through here. Uh, next, why is this important to you? Well, it's because we can actually do something about these diseases. The beautiful thing about uh, immune-mediated diseases is that you can take the immune system out and you can either just replace it with someone else's, with a bone marrow transplant, or you can take it out and fix it and put it back. It's somewhat unique among organ systems in the body. And so we're doing more and more bone marrow transplants for these diseases, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit, including in adults. So we are transplanting more adults with these diseases who've survived into adulthood. You are going to see more of these patients. Some of the gene therapy programs, we're, we're, the, our gene therapy program at Children's is, is beginning soon. Uh, we're going to start with severe combined immunodeficiency, but not very long down the road. Within a couple of years, we're hoping to open a trial for X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. And those patients, many of them very well may be adults, so uh, at least initially. So um, there will be therapies uh, in these adult patients that you may be, again, seeing some of these samples. Um, same goes for um, secondary immunodeficiencies that are being induced by these new cancer treatment approaches, uh, CAR T cell therapy and others that sometimes cause a prolonged immune deficiency that is secondary, and we will see more and more of these patients. And lastly, if I haven't convinced you yet why this is, topic is important to you, lastly is that the tools that, are, that, we, that have been developed to study the immune system in immunodeficient patients, we've got these beautiful models to sort of validate these tools are going to be applicable to other diseases that are mediated by the immune system or, or where the immune system plays a role. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. All right, so let's move on to the third topic, which is genetic testing in immunodeficiencies. Now, as I mentioned, this, has, this now plays a major role for us in clinic. Our goal as clinical immunologists, my, my dream would be able to give every patient who comes to my clinic a molecular diagnosis. And uh, you may say, why is that so important? Well, the reason that it's important is that it actually makes a huge different in, difference in how we treat these patients. Let me give you an example. We, th th there are three disorders that over the years uh, have been uh, associated with mutations in the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome is an immunodeficiency that also has a bleeding component because they have platelet problems, okay? So the complete disorder has an immunodeficiency and a platelet problem. Those patients have mutations that are severe. We find those when they're infants. We transplant them. However, there are patients who have what's called X-linked uh, X thrombocytopenia that just have the platelet problem. These are milder mutations in the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome protein. They don't have the immunodeficiency. If we have an infant who comes in with thrombocytopenia and we, we're, we're looking at, do, do we transplant them, do, do we not transplant them? Typically, we don't transplant the X-linked thrombocytopenia patients. Okay? So knowing the mutation helps us. We know prognostically what's going to happen. Uh, and lastly are, is, is a disorder called X-linked neutropenia, which is caused by, it, by mutations in a specific region of the, of the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome protein, and we don't transplant those patients. Okay? So again, it, it dictates what we do with patients. So sequencing is important. And traditionally, of course, we've done this by Sanger sequencing, good old-fashioned Sanger sequencing. But now more and more we are transitioning to next-gen sequencing. Um, and again, you're all for, are familiar with this because you have, you know, you've got Colin and John here who have taught about next-gen sequencing. But just to remind you, as we talk about next-gen sequencing, about the data analysis problem with next-gen sequencing. So if you're, if you're going to sequence the whole genome, um, you know, it's 3.2 billion bases of DNA. And, and it conveniently, Tolstoy wrote this little novel called War and Peace, uh, which has about 3 million characters in it. So, so if you get, if you do next gen sequencing, you do whole genome sequencing, you have to sift through a thousand copies of War and Peace to be able to find the one word that is misspelled, okay, that causes the disease. And the problem there is that, you know, 
200 of those 1,000 copies are written in UK English, where they spell color C-O-L-O-U-R, instead of in American English, uh, where they spell it C-O-L-O-R. And you have to tell, teach the computer, oh, you've got to ignore all of those. Those aren't really mutations, right? So you've got to do all that. So it gets complicated. Now, you can pare that down by doing exome. If you just focus in on the exome, or the part of the genome that encodes the proteins, you're, you're down to significantly fewer copies of War and Peace, but it's still 10 copies of War and Peace that you've got to sift through, right? It's still a lot of data. So, you know, jumping immediately to exome sequencing, well, we like to do that, and it is sort of a knee-jerk reaction. It is not necessarily the best approach. And so we, are, we have this luxury now with next-gen sequencing that runs this spectrum. And so just walking through this, of course, you can do Sanger sequencing and sequence one gene. And, and there are some cases where this is appropriate. You know, if you have a five-year-old boy who shows up in your clinic with recurrent pneumonias, and he's got no, very low immunoglobulin levels and no B cells, he has X-linked A gamma globulinemia until proven otherwise. I mean, it's just such a classic presentation. That's just what he has. There's no need to exome sequence that child. He has a BTK defect. And so doing a single gene is most appropriate and most cost effective in that patient. However, if you've got a patient where it's not so clear, if you need to get to the point of needing to sequence three or four genes, then the cost of a next gen approach sort of evens out. And, and you get a lot more bang for your buck on the next gen approach. So, so this is sort of the spectrum. You can do one gene by Sanger all the way to the whole genome, 20,000 genes, plus all of the intervening sequences on the other end of the spectrum. You can certainly do whole exome sequencing, again, which sort of pairs that down. There's the medical exome, which is just the 4,600 genes that have been associated with human disease. And this is the direction that a lot of places are beginning to go now. Uh, but again, the problem with these is the, is the same, one of the problems that you have with Sanger sequencing, which is that when you do Sanger sequencing, you're amplifying just the, re just the coding regions of the gene. So here's the exons. Typically, you're just amplifying the exons and the flanking, the flanking um, uh, intronic regions so you can look at the splice sites, and that's what you're sequencing. Similarly, with exome sequencing, you're just capturing the parts of the genome, genome that encode the proteins. Now, the problem comes when you've got mutations that lie out here in the deep in introns, or you've got mutations, for instance, in polyadenylation signals or other places. And, and there are certain immunodeficiency genes where we know that there are hot spots uh, in the polyadenylation signal, in intervening uh, intronic sequences, where we know that there are defects. And so these are, un unless you design a custom approach, you're going to miss these by any of these sorts of approaches. So then we get to sort of what I think of as sort of the, the intermediate thing, which is that on this end, you've got the Sanger where you can sort of custom design it and amplify and s sequence any pieces you want. Um, on this side, you've got next gen. And so here you get the best of both worlds. You can design custom capture reagents so that you can capture uh, all, of the exon all of the exons of the genes that you're interested in. And you can design capture reagents for those regions where you know there are hot spot mutations out in the introns or in, uh, signal se uh, in uh, polyden polydenylation signal sequence or in promoters where you know that there are mutations. And you can capture those as well. Or you can design a, a custom capture approach where you just capture everything through the entire locus of a particular gene. And so that's kind of what we have done with, with John and Colin is in developing this immunoplex panel. And this is sort of version one of the immunoplex panel. As you heard about, it's got 74 genes on it. We focused really on four diseases, severe combined immunodeficiency, and I'll come back to why that one was important in a couple of minutes, combined immunodeficiency, congenital A-gamma globulinemia, and hemophagocytosis. And so this has 74 of the 270 genes on it. There were three of these genes where we know there are either intronic sequences that are hot spots or polyadenylation signals that are hot spots or where we know there are a large number of insertion deletion mutations, so, so copy number variants. And so for most of the genes, we just captured the exons, but for those where we knew that there were hot spots outside of the coding region, we captured the entire locus of the gene, introns, exons, everything. Okay? And the validation studies looked 
beautiful. I'm not going to show you that data, but it picked up the patients who had copy number variants in, the, that we, in those uh, spots where we knew that there are copy number variants. It picked up the patients who had those intronic and uh, signal, uh, uh, polydentylation signal defects and did a beautiful job. So the advantage of this, of these panels, is that uh, you can capture whatever you want. You can customize it to the disease subset that you're interested in. That's what we've done with this. And, um, and it provides you the opportunity to also be able to do um, uh, uh, copy number variant analysis if you sequence very deeply. Now, um, the problem is that, you know, even with these approaches, so with exome, with exome sequencing and things, this is data from a recently published paper where they looked at all of the, um, where they looked at all of the patients who had um, been identified by newborn screening for SCID in the United States uh, over the past few years. And these were the genetic defects. And it turns out that almost 25% of them still have no genetic defect. And my suspicion is, and, and this is even with exon, exome sequencing many of these patients, my suspicion is that many of these defects are in genes that we already know about, but they lie within introns, they lie within se uh, segments of the genes that are not being captured. So what would be the ideal approach? Well, I think that m the ideal approach would be this, to do a next-gen genome gene panel. So basically, so an immunogenome where basically you capture the entire locus of all 270 immunodeficiency genes, which would allow you to look at all of those intronic sequences, all of the signal, all of the polydentylation signal sequences, all of it. Now, again, maybe this isn't the ideal approach, but I do think that this whittles down so you're not doing whole genome sequencing. You've whittled it down to a size that's still approachable um, but yet you're getting more data than just from the exons. And I think that in the end, this may be an approach. We've not done this yet. It's sort of a harebrained idea, but I do think that it may allow us to get at some of these mutations that have been elusive otherwise. Because what we know from exome sequencing is that when we do exome sequencing on unknown patients, overwhelmingly we are finding genes that we already know about. It's just a different phenotypic presentation. Uh, and it expands the clinical phenotype, but overwhelming it's genes that we already know about. It's rare that we're finding new genes. That's quite rare. And typically those patients are unusual. Okay? So that's genetic testing in immunodeficiencies. It plays an absolutely critical role in what we do in the clinic. Uh, and and uh, I just I can't emphasize that enough. It's really revolutionized what we do. So let me talk a little bit about flow cytometry testing because I think that at least for the immune system, Flow cytometry testing offers us some opportunities to do both rapid diagnostics and to validate genetic testing data. Okay, and let me show you some examples of this. So I'm going to tell you about three different types of flow cytometry testing that we do in the immunodeficiency realm. These first are disease-specific flow cytometry tests, second are functional flow cytometry tests, and last are immunophenotyping tests. And you heard a lot from Amit last week about B-cell immunophenotyping. He did a fabulous job of covering why we do that and, and why it has become so important in this field. So first of all, let's talk about disease-specific flow cytometry tests. So what we're doing with these tests is we are simply looking for the presence or the absence of a particular protein. So we know, for instance, in X-linked A gamma globulinemia that the BTK, BTK protein is mutated. And we know that about two-thirds of patients who have BTK mutations will have absent protein. Okay? So we can screen very quickly by flow cytometry. This test takes a couple of hours. And we can make the diagnosis in two-thirds of the patients by doing flow cytometry testing. Uh, and, and technically, you wouldn't need to do the genetics in those patients. You've got your answer. We do the genetics to be able to provide family counseling and other things. And, and, uh, but we don't necessarily need to do the genetics in those patients if we've got a flow test. So we've got flow, these spe gene-specific flow tests for BTK, for instance, um, uh, excellent lymphoproliferative disease uh, type 1 and type 2 with SAP and CEP mutations. You see, here's, uh, this is, uh, this is a non, the nonspecific uh, antibody um, uh, peak. Here's a normal individual with lots of BTK protein. Here's a patient, no BTK protein. No SAP protein in this patient, no, X, no CAP protein in this patient. This is a patient with IPEX uh, syndrome that lacks, uh, here's a normal individual with their FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells, and you see they're absent here. It's pretty easy to make the diagnosis, but the problem with these is that in many of these cases, 
You can, you're only going to pick up uh, between 50 and 65 percent of patients with these flow-based tests. And for the remainder, you still have to do the sequencing. Okay? So it's not perfect, but it does allow us to fairly quickly look at, uh, is this a, you know, it, 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 does the patient have the defect? The other thing that it does is if, we're, if we do the sequencing and we find a mutation, and it's not a mutation that clearly is a stop codon or a frame shift. Some of those mutations destabilize protein. And if it's a, if it's a mutation of uh, unknown significance, these variants of unknown significance, the beauty of it is we can do flow. And if the protein's absent, we've got the answer. Right? You don't need to do a functional test. You've got the answer that it destabilizes the protein and, and causes the disease. Okay, So um, again, now there are some of these tests that are actually very good, very sensitive, very specific. This is a test for a, for a genetic defect called DOC8 deficiency. Most of these patients have deletion insertion mutations that abrogate protein expression. So this test by flow picks up 99% of the patients. And the great thing about this is this gene is 40 some odd exons. It's an enormous gene. It is a, it's a nightmare to sequence. And, and so the flow test, having a flow test that picks up the overwhelming majority of patients saves you from having to sequence this gene. And it's an expensive gene to sequence if you do it by hand because it's so large. Okay, So, so this is one where, where it's highly sensitive, highly specific. And the beautiful thing about it is you can use this to follow patients after bone marrow transplant. So here is looking at in a lineage specific way at a patient. Um, this is a, a normal individual. Here's a patient who's under a DOC8 patient who's undergone bone marrow transplant who prior to transplant looked like this, who had no DOC8 protein expression, as you can see here. So here's the isotype control antibody. Here's the DOC8 protein over here. So the patient's lacking DOC8. Here, you see, he's got full donor chimerism now in the, in the uh, bulk lymphocytes in CD8, CD4 T cells, B, uh, NK cells, B cells. But look at this. In the myeloid compartment, the monocytes uh, here, because we're looking at CD14, this patient is a mixed chimera has only a small percentage, and in this case it was about 20% uh, donor chimerism in the myeloid compartment. And this matches exactly with the VNT VNTR analysis that was done. And so you can say VNTR analysis is kind of expensive. And this test is actually quite uh, qu very rapid, and you don't necessarily have to do the VNTR analysis. So you can use this to follow patients after bone marrow transplant. Second are functional flow cytometry tests. So these are tests where we actually look at the function of specific genes. And so let me give you an example. This is probably the easiest functional flow cytometry test there is. This is what's known as the dihydrorhodamine or DHR test that we do in patients who are suspected of having chronic granulomatous disease. Remember that when the neutrophils migrate into the tissues, they, they, or they get the stimulus to migrate out of the vascular space into the tissues to the site of infection. They go and they eat and they eat and they eat. And after they eat the bacteria, they, they make an oxidative burst. They, they, essentially, they make bleach. They make reactive oxygen species. And they do that so that they can activate the enzyme uh, pathways required to digest the organisms in the phagolysosomes. Okay? So it turns out that patients with chronic granulomatous disease can't make reactive oxygen species. Okay? So they, their phagocytes do everything else. They, they crawl out into the tissues. They eat just fine. They just can't digest. So their phagocytes have indigestion, basically. Right? So, so they, they eat the organisms, and then the organisms just grow and grow and grow because they're now in this little protected environment. And so they get abscesses out in the tissues. They get abscesses in lymph nodes. And typically, these abscesses are with catalase-positive organisms like staph and aspergillus and things like that. Okay? So, so basically, this test, what you do is you take a dye that does not fluoresce, you put it on the cells, you activate the cells, and if the cells make an oxidative burst, they reduce the dye, it fluoresces, and you can see that they've made an oxidative burst. So by flow cytometry, here's an unstimulated, here's the unstimulated peak, here's the stimulated peak over here, and you see there's this big increase in fluorescence. All the neutral, neutrophils almost shift over. Okay, so and then here's a patient with autosomal recessive CGD, and you see that the, the unstimulated peak is here. There's this little shift here, uh, and uh, and we see this in the autosomal recessive patients. It turns out that the X-linked patients, their peaks just directly overlap. So so this test, it's super easy. You can run this in a couple of hours. It's super cheap. The dye is just super inexpensive, and uh, the, the cost for this test is like 80 bucks including the tech time. I mean, it's ridiculously inexpensive. And not only can you di diagnose the disease, but you can tell whether it's X-linked or autosomal recessive. That's a lot of bang for your buck in a lab test. And what's even better 
is this. So this is data from a paper published from the NIH looking at 240 chronic granulomatous disease patients retrospectively and looking at survival, long-term survival related to their residual oxidative burst activity. So what they did is they, they took the patients, they did the oxidative burst, they looked at how much oxidative burst was left in the patients because depending on the mutation, some of them had a little bit, some of them had none, and they broke that down into quartiles. Okay, So there were four different groups of patients and it turns out that if you've got a little bit of residual oxidative burst, your survival over 40 years is not quite as good as the normal population, but not too bad. Okay, so that's these two best quartiles. However, if you're in one of the worst two quartiles, look at the survival. And what's, what was really interesting is that these patients tend to do just fine until they get to be teenagers or young adults, and then they start to crash. They start to fall off, and then they start to die. They start to have lots of complications, and 40-year survival is 40%. Based on this data, if we do the oxidative burst now in a patient and they fall within one of these lowest quartiles, we take them to transplant. So it dictates what we do. We don't wait for them to become teenagers or young adults and begin to have present with fungal infections or other things. We take them to transplant as infants or young children. Okay? So that is a lot of bang for the buck out of a one $90 test. Okay? So so it really makes a difference, um, and this is a functional flow assay. Let me show you this one. This is another functional flow assay that detects 100% of patients with CD40 ligand deficiency. So, so in this test, what we do is remember that T cells, when they talk to B cells, uh, when, they, when T cells get activated, they express CD40 ligand, which interacts with CD40 on the B cell and tells that B cell to undergo immunoglobulin class switching. So we can take the T cells and look at their CD40 ligand expression at baseline, and then look at them after we activate them, and you see this big increase in CD40 ligand. Now, patients who have this disorder called X-linked um, uh, hyper-IgM syndrome, these patients lack CD40 ligand, as shown here. But it turns out that there's about 10% of patients who have this disease who express the protein just fine. The protein's there, it's just not functional. It doesn't bind to CD40. And so in this test, we also include a construct that is the CD40 receptor fused to immunoglobulin heavy chain, okay? So it creates sort of a pseudo receptor. This is sort of like, it's similar to like Enbrel is for TNF blockade. Anyway, but it's, it's, a, it's a CD40. And we include that as a functional test of CD40 ligand activity. And between looking at protein expression and function, we can diagnose 100% of patients with X-linked hyper-IgM syndrome without having to do a genetic test. It's quick, it's easy, and technically you wouldn't have to do the genetics, but, uh, but we do it. And this can also be used to look, again, to follow patients post-transplant. Here's a patient with X-linked hyper-IgM syndrome who underwent bone marrow transplant. Here's before transplant, you see no CD40 ligand expression, no binding. And after transplant, you see CD40 ligand expression and binding in about 20% of, of the cells. The patient was a mixed chimera, has about 20% uh, T cell uh, chimerism from the donor, but 20% is all you need. Actually, 10% is all you need, and he's fixed. Okay? And we can follow that post transplant and follow the stability. Here's another one that's, that's a, an interesting functional flow test looking at stat signaling. So, this is a disease called uh, IL 10 receptor deficiency. These patients who have defects in the IL-10 receptor, remember that IL-10 is a, an immunosuppressive cytokine. It quiets down the immune system. And it turns out that if patients have mutations in the IL-10 receptor, they can't get, their cells can't get signals from the IL-10 receptor, and they stay activated. And what they get is this severe early onset fistulating colitis. This is like the worst Crohn's disease you've ever seen but it begins typically in young children. And this is the bottom, if you don't recognize the anatomy here, uh, the, the bottom of one of our patients with IL-10 receptor deficiency. You see all of these fistulas. This is a flow cytometry test that we offer clinically to screen these patients because, um, because what we need to do is look at the function of the receptor. Okay? There, again, there haven't, there's not a ton of mutations known in this. So even if there, a new mutation is found, we need to know whether it has a functional defect. That's really the more, most important thing. So we offer this as a functional test. So, so this is looking at STAT3 phosphorylation inside the cell. So STAT3 is the transcription factor that gets activated by IL-10 receptor activation. So 
we use as a control IL-21 stimulation here, and here's IL-10 in green. So this is unstimulated cells in red, stimulated by IL-10 in green, IL-21 in blue, and here's the patient. Unstimulated, stimulated with IL-10, there's no shift, whereas with IL-21 there's a normal shift. And this is him post-transplant, no stimulation, IL-10 in two different doses in green and yellow, and here is the patient here. This is sort of the normal, this is the normal control, sorry. This is the patient, and you see now he's got a shift. He's got normal IL-10 responses. And this is what his bottom did post-transplant. These are the fistulas pre-transplant, day 10 plus transplant, day 100 post-transplant, and at one year post-transplant, uh, he came to our clinic for his follow-up visit and was super excited to tell me that he had just crossed off one of the items on his bucket list, which was to eat pizza. So, simple pleasures. So, that's, that's what we love. So, um, so anyway, these, these tests really allow us to make rapid diagnoses and, and to make a big difference uh, in these patients' lives. So, so, three important points to make about flow cytometry testing. First is that it's rapid, uh, it's useful for monitoring uh, after bone marrow transplant, and it, evalu it, it evaluates functional reconstitution after bone marrow transplant or gene therapy. One of the things, of course, that we and others have uh, learned over the years is that good research assays don't necessarily make great clinical assays. And so uh, in order to develop these sorts of functional tests for these sort of niche markets, um, I do think that it's important to, I mean, first of all, you need access to good controls that you can use for validation. So having access to patient samples is super important. And having access to, uh, to research labs who can help make reagents for you that you can use to validate is also extraordinarily helpful if you want to develop these sorts of assays. Um, and lastly, I would argue that in the era of genomics where we are getting more and more tests where they send us the exome sequencing report and they say, this variant of unknown significance, in fact, I just got one yesterday sent from a colleague in Wisconsin. We, we had this patient. They had this variant of unknown significance in CD40 ligand. Can you figure it out for us? Absolutely. Send, us, send the assay that I just showed you for CD40 ligand, and we can tell you with 100% certainty, is the protein expressed and is it functional? Okay. So we, I would argue that we need more functional tests in this area of genomics. There's a lot of focus now on the genomics. That's important. But there are a growing number of these variants of unknown significance. And the, you know, I, we, in the early days of this, there was a panel offered by a company out there to look at six different SCID genes. They were doing it by Sager sequencing. People would send their samples there, but then they would send us the report. And I remember getting a report on a patient who, of the six SCID genes, had five of the genes had mutations in them. And, they, and the docs sent them to us and said, help, <laughs> tell us where the defect is. And we're like, ah, you know, what do we do with that? So, so these tests are really important for figuring out these variants of unknown significance, okay? Sorry. Um, Amit talked about B cell phenotyping. I'm not going to dwell on that. It plays a very important role, as Amit pointed out, in the diagnosis of patients with common variable immunodeficiency. It's, we realize now that it's important enough that it's actually been included, as Amit pointed out, as one of the diagnostic criteria for this disease. And this now, be, based on what we have learned in the immunodeficiency world, we're now applying this to patients who've had bone marrow transplants, patients with other immune-mediated diseases, and uh, are, are learning, uh, I guess, how that can be applicable in those diseases. This is, uh, this is related to the B, B cell phenotyping because one of the things that we, that we look at when we do B cell phenotyping is we look at, this, at, this, uh, at a cell surface receptor called BAF receptor, which is the receptor for one of the major uh, growth cytokines for B cells known as BAF and April. And BAF receptor is expressed on B cells and when in, in the setting of uh, when there are low B cell counts, um, the, um, uh, BAF, uh, the BAF levels in the serum, because your body wants B cells, so circulating BAF levels go way up and the receptor levels on the B cells go way down. Okay, So it's a marker sort of a B cell lymphopenia. And so we look at this when, when in our standard B cell phenotyping panel, we look at BAF receptor expression. And you can see here that in, in normal individuals, uh, this is uh, BAF receptor expression is on this axis. In normal individuals, they've got their B cells express a lot of BAF. And if you look at their circulating BAF levels, it's fairly low. However, in a patient who's got low B cells, BAF receptor expression goes down, 
and circulating bath levels go up, okay? And it turns out that in, uh, we and now others have recently published uh, as well that um, pairing BAF receptor expression levels on B cells, so doing B cell phenotyping with circulating BAF levels turn out to be exquisitely sensitive for detecting chronic graft-versus-host disease in patients who have undergone bone marrow transplant. Graft-versus-host disease that sometime had, sometimes had not been evident by the standard biopsy, the places that they typically look. So this might be deep in the bowel, et cetera. So, so here is comparing, so BAF receptor expression levels in red, BAF, circulating BAF levels in blue. Here are two patients in this cohort that we had of adult patients with uh, who, had, uh, who did not have chronic graft-versus-host disease, and you see they had high BAF levels and, so, sorry, high BAF receptor levels and low b circulating BAF levels in normal individuals, and look at all these patients with chronic graft-versus-host disease. It's very sensitive, totally flipped. And so it's, this is a very sensitive test for detecting patients in chronic graft-versus-host disease. So, so I guess getting to the point that assays developed to study these immunodeficiency diseases can be used now in other realms where they can be very useful biomarkers for disease. This, I think, has been an unequivocal success. So <clears throat> the disease I'm going to talk about is, uh, is severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID. This is the boy in the plastic bubble. And um, this is, uh, this is uh, th th it was made famous by uh, this film, which was an early John Travolta effort. Uh, um, I'm not going to comment on that. Anyway. Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the actual patient here. Uh, this is the patient, uh, David Vetter. And da the story is absolutely fascinating. So it's sort of this confluence of, uh, David was born in Houston, of course, where the space program is based, and there were all these engineers who had extra time on their hands. And David had an older brother who had died of skid, and we, when he was born, they thought they were going to be able to do a bone marrow transplant from his sister, so they, he was born and put immediately in the plastic bubble. And then it turned out his sister was not a match for the bone marrow transplant. And at this point, they hadn't done haploidentical transplants. And then they were like, oh, geez, he's in the bubble. Now what do we do? Well, we're, they just raised him in the bubble, right? So he was raised in the bubble uh, until he was about 12 when, he made, when uh, bone marrow transplant had, had advanced to the point that they decided to try a haplotransplant from his sister. They did the haplotransplant. Within a month of getting the haplotransplant, he had developed a fever. And he came out of the bubble for the first time. The first time that his mother touched his skin age 12, out of the bubble, he was found to have an EBV-driven lymphoma, EBV in his sister's cells that had been given to him. It was actually one of the first cases that documented a direct link between oncogenic viruses and cancer. So we learned a lot from this young man. Uh, he gave a lot, but a lot was learned from him. And that's the boy in the plastic bubble. The thing we know about this disease is if we transplant, after they get infections. So if we wait for them to present in our clinics with infections, which is how they present, because when they're born, they've got mom's antibodies, they're doing okay. It's when they get three, four, five, six months old, they get their antibodies go away, they get infections, that's when they present. And they're sick, they've got lots of viruses, pneumocystis, pneumonia. Transplant success in those patients, survival is around 60%, okay? And transplants are ugly. They're difficult and prolonged. If you can catch them before they get infections, survival rates are 90 plus percent, 95 plus percent, actually, we now know. Okay, so that was the idea behind doing newborn screening. Catch them early, transplant them before they get infections, and so they did newborn screening. Okay, so remember that skid is caused by an absence of T cells. This is what the immune system looks like in a skid patient. It may look like this as well. They're missing the T cells. And this may be due to a number of different defects. There's now 21 different defects that can cause skid. Depending on where the defect is, it may block just T cell development or it may block B cells, NK cells, et cetera. Okay? So the, the way that the test is done, newborn screening was initiated a few years ago. Wisconsin was the first state to initiate. We've been screening in the state of Washington since the beginning of 2014. Okay? The way that the test is done, it's looking for something called T cell receptor excision circles. Now, just to remind you what these are, remember that when T cells rearrange their immune, or, sorry, their T cell receptor locus, particularly the TCR delta locus. This is the chromosome. They loop out these pieces as they're pulling together the different parts that, in, that encode the gene to make the T cell receptor. They loop out these pieces of chromosome and they snip them off. 
and they ligate them back together to form a circle. So this is like an episomal piece of DNA that gets cut out and it's hanging around. These, the, the areas where they get cut and glued back together are conserved, okay? So these are called T cell receptor excision circles. They're episomal, they don't replicate with the rest of the DNA. So, so a naive T cell, as it goes through the thymus, it's here, it's, the T cells have these, these T cell receptor excision circles, TREX, but then as they divide, those go to one daughter cell or the other, and they don't, um, they, so, so in the end, as, as, you know, as you get old, you have very few T cells that have TREX in them. When you're an infant and have all naive cells, you have tons of TREX, okay? So what they decided is on the newborn dried blood spots, they would just do quantitative PCR for this conserved region that's right here where, the, where the, it gets cut out and glued back together. You can do quantitative PCR for these and quantitate the number of TREX in the dried blood spot. And if there's a lot of naive T cells, there's lots of TREX. If there's no naive T cells, there's no TREX. Or if there's no T cells, there's no TREX, okay? So it's great. Now, one of the situations that we see in skid babies is that sometimes they'll get, in utero, they'll get maternally engrafted. They have no T cells. They can't reject it. So mom cells will get in and begin to grow and divide inside the baby. That can be problematic because it can cause graft-first associated disease. But, but what's great about the, this test is that even if mom's T cells get in and they grow in the divide and the baby is born with a normal T cell number, those are all old T cells. They've all divided a bunch. They have no more tracks left in them. So even if the baby has T cells, the test still identifies the baby. It is a great test. It's a fantastic screening test. Very sensitive. Um, and, uh, and it works really nicely. And so this has really been uh, an une unequivocal success. And so there have now been, in the states that are screening, I showed you the map, uh, the blue states are the states that are screening. Purples are the ones that are coming online shortly. Greens are the ones who are not screening. Um, but it soon will be across the country and p uh, babies are being picked up. Survival rate of transplant, the, 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 the experience with transplant is being written up in these patients identified by newborn screening. It's 95% survival in these patients. It is a huge success. So you're taking kids who are otherwise consigned to certain death unless they, they were picked up and making them long-term survivors. Now the other cool thing that's come out of this, prior to newborn screening we thought the incidence of SCID was about 1 in 100,000. We now know it's 1 in 50,000. Half of the babies never even made it to us. So not only did we only save 60 percent of the ones who came infected, we're, we're missing 50% right off the top, okay? So, so this has really been a, a tremendous success. And I think in terms of screening these patients, it's really been phenomenal. So, so what I've told you is that um, we uh, have given you just sort of a review of immunodeficiencies. We've talked about why this is important to you. Genetic testing, we've talked about in immunodeficiencies. We've talked about flow cytometry. We skipped across, skipped past some of these other functional tests that we do. And lastly, we talked about the role of screening tests in these diseases. And there are more screening type tests under development. I think this is an area that is of great interest in the field. There are a number of unmet needs. I'm not going to go through these, but these involve areas where there is a need because of newborn screening, because of other diseases, and there are not great tests uh, in these particular areas. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but, but I'm happy to share this. And ultimately, this is the reason why we do what we do. This is a young girl who came to us with SCID. She was cured by bone marrow transplant. And we, the, the great thing about these immunodeficiency diseases is we don't just talk about palliating disease, making their lives a little bit better. We can talk about cure. And that's what makes this so awesome. Uh, because we can identify a genetic defect and then we can do something about it, which is, which is really awesome. So I just want to acknowledge all of the folks who've been fantastic collaborators, the folks in our, uh, in our immunology group, uh, the folks in the IDL lab who've worked so hard, uh, Hans and Andy who, who helped there, the folks in the Washington State Lab who developed the screening test for the SCID screen here in the state, uh, the folks at Children's and Lab Medicine that have been just unbelievably great collaborators, and uh, UW Lab Medicine, John and Colin, who've, who've really been fabulous to work with and I've learned a lot from. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. What a fabulous talk, thank you so much. What, what's happened, what, what do you think was happening to those half the children who weren't detected? Were they dying at young age? What, what yeah, so the, so the question is, what was happening to the young children who, who weren't detected? So that 50% of skid patients who weren't detected, and that's what we suspect is that they were, these were kids who were 
acutely ill because, again, they, they, the way that they presented typically was um, with infections. And so some of our skid patients have come to us with five viruses, five active viral infections all at the same time. Uh, but to give you an example, we, we had a skid patient who, uh, from North Dakota who, who, had lingered, who got RSV pneumonia, or pneumonitis, I should say, um, and a bronchiolitis, w was at a local hospital for a while, was just sort of progressively worsening, not getting a lot better, was then transferred to a regional hospital, continued to worsen over the course of a few more weeks. And it wasn't until the child had been sick for about five weeks with RSV that somebody, that they kind of said, well, geez, RSV doesn't usually go on this long. Usually we, you know, they, they get better. They either get worse and, and die right away or they get better. So this is weird. And he's just, you know, the baby's still shedding RSV. And they brought, they brought in a local immunologist who made the immediate diagnosis of SCID, you know, did it, ran a, uh, you know, did, did it actually just a CBC and the kid was very lipopenic and, uh, and then confirmed it, that there were no T cells. So, so that kid, had that kid not gotten to the regional hospital, would have just died, would have been chalked up as an RSV death uh, and would have never been diagnosed. And we think that that's probably what happened to most of them. So, yes. Um, yeah, I had a question about um, using BAF levels. Is there utility using it in patients, for example, undergoing photophoresis for GVHD to monitor response to therapy? So the question is about using BAF levels in patients with uh, undergoing phototherapy for GVHD, and that is a great question. And I will tell you that I, I don't know because... I have I, I don't know what the effect of phototherapy is actually on BAF levels and BAF. I, I, I guess I would be, be more concerned about the BAF receptor level on the on the B cells. I don't know what effect that would have on the B cells. Um, you know, I would predict that the BAF levels would be would be high because probably they're a little bit B lymphopenic. But it's a it's a great question, and whether it would be also a, a good biomarker in in those patients, I, I think it, we just it, it hasn't been done to look at it. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, it um, that it, it it has the potential. We've not done sort of extended those studies to look at patients who are under you know who are under therapy to look at them once you know while they've got active disease and then down the road once they've really kind of resolved, do those flip back? Uh, we haven't gone that far out. It's it's something we'd like to do, but we just haven't had the funding to do it yet. 